Hi everybody, welcome to tonight's live. We are going to be talking all about teaching an adolescent service dog in training to relax, to settle. Um, because this is certainly one of the things that can be challenging about owning, living with, working, training an adolescent dog, right? So there's lots of things. We asked you guys to vote inside of our group, Train Your Service Dog with Confidence, and this was one of the top few um, things that were voted for. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, if you're watching the replay, um, then you're watching the replay, and anything that we, you know, any resources I mentioned will still be available to you. Okay, let me, um, really quick, I forgot to open a, there we go one of the windows. There. I haven't used this piece of software um, in a little while, so I'm a little bit rusty with it. But, okay, so like I was saying, <laughs> teaching an adolescent dog to relax can be kind of challenging. Um, I think that that is one of the things that we tend to take advantage of with our puppies when they're in kind of that like sleepy puppy phase and then when they're even older puppies and they're still relatively easy to um, exercise into calmness and then for a lot of our dogs they hit adolescence and all of a sudden it's much harder to get them to settle so I have a lot of dogs if you guys have been following me for a while you know I, I own and live with quite a few dogs <laughs> Um, and some of them have certainly been more challenging than others, but they have all had an adolescent period. And because I, in my personal life, not when I'm training a service dog for somebody, um, but in my personal life, I have a lot of high drive, high energy working dogs. Adolescence has been particularly challenging in this in this area for me with a couple of them. My Beauceron, for example, my Pyrenean Shepherd, my Australian Shepherd, the Border Collies I've had in the past. Um... My tollers were pretty good about it, but you know, most of my, most of my dogs were brought into my home to work a high energy job, like search and rescue, sheep, herding sheep, um, competing in agility, those types of things. So my point is <laughs> I have lived this and I feel for everybody deep inside if you are living with a challenging, with a dog who is struggling to relax, especially in the house, but out in public as well. So that's what we're talking about tonight. Um, the funny thing about this is that we just finished, well, we're just wrapping up a challenge on this topic inside of our academy. So for my students, if I have academy members here, this is going to be like a little bit of a recap for you. And then um, we are doing a full sort of master class to wrap up our challenge. Um, so I just kind of want it for my students who are watching. So the first thing that you have to do when it comes to teaching a dog to settle or relax is you have to really remember that you can never know what's going on inside your dog's brain. So it's really easy for us to be like, oh, I just need him to relax. We're just working on relaxing um, all of these things, but we can never know what's really going on inside of our dog's mind. So what this means is that the first step is you need to know what relaxation looks like and you need to know what it looks like on your dog. And you need to spend some time thinking about this um, because otherwise you're really going to struggle. And this was a lesson that was actually taught to me by one of my horses because I do use positive reinforcement and clicker training with my horses as well. And I was trying to teach my older, or not my older, but um, my gelding to be calmer around the food. And halfway through the session, I realized, what am I even training for? Like I haven't operationalized what this looks like on a horse yet. So we have to do that with our dogs, okay? We're looking for body language like tail set, ear set, body position and posture, eye set, muscle tension, these types of things. Now, all of our dogs use the same set of body language, but it does look different on different dogs. And I find that each dog has different tells. So what I mean by this is every dog is going to, when they're, when they're very relaxed, they're going to relax their tail. And it's going to drop. Like it's going to, it's going to sit lower. However, that is going to look very different on a pug as it is on like a whippet that naturally carries their tail low. Um, all dogs' ears are going to relax when they are relaxing. Again, that's going to look very different on like a Shih Tzu versus like a German Shepherd. 
So all of our dogs are going to do these behaviors, but they're going to look a little different based on our dog's physical appearance. Now, I also find that all dogs, like I said, all dogs are going to use these, this same set of body language to communicate, but I find that they have different ones they go to first. And I find this to be true whether we're talking about stress, over arousal, or in this case, relaxation. So for an ex- as an example, my Pyrenean Shepherd Epic can look totally relaxed, ears, eyes, body position, his muscles are loose, but until his tail, which he naturally carries over his back, until it's laying flat on the floor, I know he's not relaxed. Like he hasn't fully relaxed until I see that tail relax. My, one of my Nova Scotia duck tolling retrievers, toller for short, so you can hear me say the rest of this this class, um, he, I, I have to see it in his eyes and his muscles. So it doesn't matter what position he's laying in. It doesn't matter what his ears or his tail is doing. Um, He's fully relaxing when I see it in his eyes and in his, and I see his muscles relax. So it's going to look different. Okay. And it's really important that as you're working on relaxation or settling or any of these, whatever we're going to call this behavior, you really need to know what it looks like on your dog so that you know what it is that you're training for. And you also need to know what behaviors or activities help your dog to relax. So for example, those same two dogs I just talked about, Epic, chewing on a bone relaxes him. Like he, you will see his eyes relax, his tail relax, his whole body relax. He almost falls asleep. Striker actually gets more and more excited as he's chewing on a bone, but licking out of a frozen Kong really relaxes him. Now, some of my dogs I can kind of pet or massage into relaxing. Some of my dogs, you know, they enjoy being pet, but that's not something that relaxes them. So it's really important that you know not only what your dog looks like when he's relaxed, but also what activities or behaviors help him to relax because these are things that are going to help you as you try to teach this to your adolescent dog. Now, the one thing I forgot to put a slide on, and I want to mention really quick before we move into the rest of the slides, is that with our adolescents, it's also really important that we take a minute to talk about exercise Um, because, and now I'm really kicking myself for not putting some slides in here, (laughs) It is really important that we meet our adolescent dog's needs for exercise. They need physical exercise in order to be able to relax and settle. Without it, it's not fair to ask this of them. However, too much of the wrong types of exercise can actually work against us. So for example, if I have an adolescent dog and I have to walk him three miles every day so that he'll relax eventually he's going to be in better shape and he's going to have to go four miles and then he's going to have to go five miles. You see, we just get them in better and better shape. So while we need to, we do need to do the exercise, we don't want to over-exercise either. So exercise is not the piece that's going to solve the problem. And no, there are no slides on this this part because I, I forgot them. Um, the other thing about exercise, and I do have a separate video on this, so I will put that in the description when we're done here, is I really like to follow like the exercise formula, especially with a, an adolescent dog, where we're going to do 10 to 20 minutes of physical exercise, so chasing a ball, bike, you know, riding a bike, playing tug of war, something that really gets their heart pumping. Then we're going to do 10 minutes of mental exercise, so we're going to do training of some type, and then I like to give them something to chew on. And by stepping it down like that, it can really help teach them, first of all, we meet their needs for exercise, and then it can really help teach them to come down from that exercise and to relax. So I will put, I have a separate video on the the exercise formula, and I will put that in the um, description when we're done here so that you guys can watch that video. And then my final note on exercise (laughs) is that overly exciting forms of exercise can also work against us. So When the body becomes physiologically stressed, it can take, depending on the research that you look at, up to three full days for those hormones to leave the body. Now, during that time, the body is going to be more likely to become stressed again because those hormones are already floating around. The body doesn't necessarily know the difference between good stress and bad stress. So if I 
do an extremely overly exciting form of exercise with my adolescent dog today and tomorrow and the next day, I keep those hormones high and actually make it harder and harder for him to settle. I learned this the hard way when one of my tollers was, uh, when he was, my first one was an adolescent, so he's like 12 now, 10, 12, this was like 10 years ago, Um, and we used to play fetch every day, but fetch for him makes him so unbelievably over aroused that I was actually making it harder for him to settle in the house. Now I have other dogs in my home that I could play fetch with every single day because they enjoy it, it gets them running, but it's not overly exciting. Okay, we're gonna move on. So those are the thoughts on exercise, but it really is important to start there because if we aren't meeting our dog's needs for exercise, it's not fair to ask them to settle. And if we're using exercise inappropriately, we're probably making it harder for ourselves. All right, so. On to the next topic. So the first way that I really like to train this is uh, smart times 50. Now, this is Kathy Sedeo's protocol. She outlines it in her book, um, Plenty in Life is Free, which is one of my favorite dog training books of all time that I absolutely think every, every single person should read. So I will put that in the description of this video as well um, when we're done here. Absolutely fantastic book, but this is her protocol and it comes out of there. And this is what I start with. So what it's called, what it stands for is C mark and reward training times 50. Okay. Basically, you're going to count out 50 healthy treats and 50 is not nearly as much as it looks like. It's less than half a cup of dog food. And then you're going to reinforce your dog throughout the day with that 50, with those 50 treats. When I have an adolescent dog, especially, but like really a a dog of any age who's having trouble relaxing and settling down in the house or out in public, like if we're having a relaxation or settling problem in any area of life, then the vast majority of my Smart Times 50 protocol is going to be for settling or being relaxed. So what I'm going to do, like in this picture, when I see my dog nice and relaxed, I'm just going to walk up. You can mark so you can say yes or good. And then I'm just going to drop a treat right in front of them. And then I'm going to go right back to what I was doing. Now, it's very, very normal when you begin this for your dog to get, like, eat the treat, get up, and then start moving around again, whether he's following you or doing something else. That's very, very normal. As you do this more and more, that stops happening. So, like, my dogs, you can hand them a treat, walk away, and they just go right back to to being fully relaxed. But the way that learning works is the more something is reinforced, the faster it's going to, the faster you're going to learn it. So by reinforcing being relaxed 50 times a day, you're really quickly building that behavior. You're building a reinforcement history for that behavior. I find smart times 50 to be like throwing gasoline on a fire. So I'm building a fire. I'm feeding my fire. That's my training process, right? I'm like putting the right fuel on the fire, making sure it has the right level of oxygen, all the things that it takes to build a fire. Smart times 50 is like throwing gasoline on it so that it just burns. It just gets the job done faster. So that is absolutely my top thing. And the other thing that I love about the Smart Times 50 protocol, especially for owner trainers, is that if you're having a bad health day, if you're having a a stress day, if you're having a day where you're just not feel like you're just not up to training, you've got you were too busy to train, you can still do Smart Times 50 just as you go about your normal daily life and still be working on whatever your biggest challenge is, whether that be relaxing, coming when called, chewing on their own stuff, any of those things. Smart Times 50 is a really good way for owner trainers to keep momentum in their training, even on days where you're not up to training. So Smart Times 50 is the first thing that I'm going to do. Now, the second thing is I'm going to actually train a relaxation protocol. Now, there are a lot of these floating around uh, the internet. I use relax on a map. That's what we're going to walk through here. There are lots of versions of this. There are lots of relaxation protocols you can train. But I do find that teaching one is really important. And I like relax on a mat because then I have the mat as a tool to use wherever I go. So I can use it while I'm watching TV to help my dog relax in the evenings. I can use it when my dog is ready for public access. I can take it out and about with me and help to work on relaxing there. 
And because I have the physical prop, it really gives my dog another cue to help them understand what I'm looking for. And because I'm putting so much time and food and reinforcement into building this map behavior, it becomes a very strong behavior with a very large reinforcement history that allows it to hold up to other things in the environment if you are also using good training. So all this distraction stuff, which I know is one of the other things. So we'll, we're going to talk about that next week, say Saturday. Um, so what, and that's one of the biggest, I think, myths, misconceptions, complaints, whatever word you want to use about positive reinforcement is that, oh, well, the one treat I have in my hand isn't better than whatever is going on out there. Right. No, exactly. One hot dog is never going to be better than chasing deer or taking ice cream from children or whatever it is. One treat is never going to be better than that. However, the thousands of treats that I have delivered to my dog for relaxing on a mat, that reinforcement history can hold up to things like that if I'm using other good training tactics, okay? So we still have to be good trainers. We have to have good mechanics. We have to have good proofing skills, all of these things. Um, but so that's why I find relax on a mat to be really, really powerful. And I also find it to be really powerful because it has the physical mat it helps you, the handler, and your dog to, it helps keep things really clear. Like, you know what you're training, and you know when you're training it. Your dog knows what you're training and when you're training it. And that helps everybody to be more clear about what's going on, and that helps our dogs to be more successful. So I do not leave a mat out all the time. I only use the mat when I'm training it. Okay, so we're going to walk through the protocol real quick, and then I'm going to show you guys a couple videos. So the first thing I'm going to do is charge the mat in quotes. Now, what I mean by this is I'm literally just going to put the mat down, throw a handful of food on it, let my dog get off. Put the mat down, throw a handful of food on it. Let my, I just want my dog to associate the mat with treats so that when I put the mat down, they want to go there. They're like, yes, I get to go to the mat. I get all my treats there. And I like to do a handful because I really like that sniffing behavior. For most dogs, that's a behavior that does help to calm them. So then we're helping to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We're, oh, we're helping to build that relaxation because they're, we're doing a scatter feed, basically. And scatter feeding is something that can really help our dogs to be calmer. Then I'm going to shape down on the mat and I'm going to, and duration of the down. So what that means is, you know, once I can put the mat down and my dog goes straight to it, now I'm going to say, okay, well, can you sit on the mat? Can you down on the mat? I'm going to reinforce that stuff. And then I'm going to build duration on that down so that my dog can go to his mat, lay down, and stay there for about 30 minutes, or 30 seconds, not 30 minutes, 30 seconds. And then I will move to the next step, which is actually shaping relaxed body language. So in the beginning, I just taught my dog to lay down on the mat, but now I'm going to start re actively reinforcing, selectively reinforcing moments where my dog gives me relaxed body language. So when he rolls onto one hip, when he lowers his head to the, to the ground, that's a really good one for a lot of dogs, teaching them to put their head on the ground. Um, maybe if I get a sigh, if they go, <sighs> something like that, then I'm going to reach down and deliver a treat. And then finally, after that, we'll build even more duration and more relaxation. So that's the, the process in a nutshell. So I want to show you guys a few videos. Let me look at these um, questions real quick. Um, okay, and it doesn't, it's not telling me today, I think I forgot to put the link in the comments, so it's not telling me who is asking these questions, so I apologize for that. Um, so with, uh, with Smart Times 50 for relaxing, do you need to use a command? I do not. I am just capturing good behavior as it happens throughout the day. Um, and then we have a question about the mat is phased out as a cue and replaced with a word. So um, here's a couple of things. And then we'll get into, we'll get into videos um, about this process. Yes, we can fade the mat out. Because you don't want to have to carry the mat around forever, especially out in public. Um, but... A lot of handlers do choose to carry a mat forever because sometimes we need our dogs to lay down in places that are like 
really just icky. Um, so a lot of handlers do carry a mat. I never put my relaxation or my settle on a verbal cue because I find that that really is a very slippery slope for, for me, but also for handlers I've worked with where we start to remind the dog to settle over and over and over and over. And really, I want this to be a default behavior. So a default behavior for me is one in which the environment cues the behavior and I never have to deliver a cue. So for a service dog, this generally looks like if you're on a leash and I sit down in a chair, you should relax until cued otherwise. So that ends up being the cue eventually is me sitting in the chair with a dog on a leash. That is the cue to relax. Um, those types of things. Um, yeah, so, so we, can, we do, you can fade the mat out. And I recommend that everybody does because you want your dog to relax in public even if you forget your mat. Um, I personally never attach a verbal cue because I don't think it helps, to be perfectly honest. I think that it leads to sloppy training. What I want for you to do is to become a good enough trainer that you use your, your reinforcement alone to teach the dog to settle without the verbal cue. And then should you ever need it, you'll, your dog will know how to do a stay. So if for some reason out in public you had to cue a stay, you could. But that is not the same as a settle, just to be clear. Okay, so then any other questions, you guys can put them in the comments. I'll answer them at the end. So we're going to go through the uh, just, a ha just a couple of videos here, and then we'll, we'll do any other questions. Um, okay, so the f okay, so we said train a relaxation protocol. That's what we're talking about. And charge the mat was the, the first step here. So this is the third attempt at me doing this with one of my pet dogs. So this is what I'm actually looking for. Um, actually, let me just super quick. Hold on just a second. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can grab another video too. I'm not sure if my internet is fast enough and I won't hold us back, but okay, there we go. So here is the process of what this looks like and then I'll show you what I'm looking for. Okay. This is 51 seconds. I'm going to mute it because you don't need to hear anything that's happening in the video. If I can, it's not letting me. So I put the mat down. This is not her first attempt with it. So you saw me put the mat down and she went right to it because this is not her very first attempt with it. But you see how I am delivering handfuls of treat of food. This is just dog food, but I'm delivering handfuls of treats because I want her to sniff around and I also really want this to be, a, I want her to really love this mat. I want this mat to be her favorite place in the entire world. And the only way to do that is to be really, really good about delivering lots of treats. So there, I just tossed a piece of food to get her off. And then we're going to do it again. I'm wondering now if this is the same behavior, if this is the same video we just watched. Maybe not. So this is what I want to happen, right? I put the mat down, she immediately goes to it, and I deliver a handful of food. Once I have this, then I can move to the next step. Um, <laughs> that was my son on the video there. <laughs> um, let me, hold on, hold on. I want to get grab one more video here that I forgot to download. So that's what I'm looking for with the, in quotes, charge the mat. I'm trying to just help my dogs to think that the mat is a really great place and it's some place that they want to go to. I see handlers skip this step a lot, and I do think that that's a mistake because I think that this is a really easy step to really start building that reinforcement history. And I think that it makes the rest of the steps easier because our dogs are so excited to go to their mat. Okay, so then the next step is to shape the down and then get a duration of the down. So again, what I mean by that, and I have a YouTube video on shaping, is that 
we are going to use shaping to get the dog to lay down. So I am not going to cue him to lay down. I'm going to put the mat down, deliver some treats, and then just wait. If the dog sits, I'm going to reinforce that. I'm going to reinforce that a few times. And then I'm going to wait and I'm going to see if the dog can offer me a down. Now, I hope that this is the video that I'm thinking of because honestly, it might not be. And this is a, an 11-minute video, so we're not going to watch the whole thing. I'll move me out of the way there. So this is a very excited puppy <laughs> learning about relax on a mat. So you can see that we're at that. This is kind of a charging step here. I am going to jump forward. Here, I'm starting to shape the down. And I'm also working on politeness with food. That's a whole separate video if you guys want to talk about that. Um, so here we're working on kind of that shaping of the down piece. So I'm waiting for him to sit and or lay down on the mat. If I need to put the dog on a leash, I will. So there you see he sits on the mat, so he gets a cookie. It's just dog food. And this time he's going to, I think he's going to offer it himself. I mean, he's going to offer it again. You can see him really thinking. Excellent. So now we've got the sit. So I'm going to reinforce the sit until he can get on his mat and instantly sit. And when he can instantly sit, then I'm going to start waiting for a down. I'm going to jump forward again, and let's see if we're getting a down. This is because I, I said, like I said, I'm not sure if this is the video that I'm waiting for, looking for. But it'll work. It's getting the point across. There we get a down. So now I'm starting to wait for that down, okay? Now, I do think that it's really important that you have captured a sit and a down before you do this exercise. I have a YouTube video on capturing as well, and I will put that in the description of this video too, because I think that capturing a down before you move to the mat is really, really important. So then once I have a dog who's, I put the mat down and he instantly goes to it and lays down. Now I'm going to start to shape, like I said, selectively reinforce for more and more relaxed body language. So I'm going to look for a dog to roll onto his hip, uh, to put his head down, to uncurl his tail, those types of things. And then finally, I'm going to just build more relaxation. So what I want to show you guys is this video. This is on super fast forward because this was a 20 minute video of me working on relax on a mat same lab as before but when he's older so this is going so this is a, a 30 minute training session that has been condensed down to 13 minutes by going on fast forward once i have a dog who really does love the mat will go there and instantly lay down and i do have 30 seconds of duration i can start to selectively reinforce for relaxed body language once I have that, some dogs need this extra step. So here I'm on the computer because I, it's really important. This is vital. Without this, this training protocol will fail. In this training session, he is learning that he can earn treats even when I'm not engaging with him, even when I'm busy doing something else. If he believes that the only way to get treats is for me to be looking at and engaging with him, then he is not going to settle if I'm not paying attention. Okay, so that's what we're working on here. Is him just learning, you can do all these things you want, fidget around, get up and down, do all these things, I'm ignoring you. And when you settle, that's when I'll deliver a treat. I'm going to jump forward to more towards the end of the session. And I'm still just working on my computer delivering food for being more and more relaxed and also throwing in some petting. So now we're kind of doing an extra step. So can I reach down and pet you and then you go back to relaxing? This step is very, like I said, this is very important because they need to learn that they can earn reinforcements even when I'm not paying attention. Without that, our adolescent dogs are going to constantly seek our attention because it's the only way for them to get food, which brings us right back to smart times 50 in the beginning, where we are reinforcing them throughout the day for relaxing, right? And you're doing that without making a big to-do about it. You're walking over, you might say yes or good, you're delivering the treat, and you're going right back to what you were doing. So see, it's all connected, right? <laughs> okay, so if you have any questions about this stuff, Put them in the comments, and I will, um, if you're here live, and I'll answer those now. 
we are going to be talking about more of these types of things over the next few days. And we're going to get to, you know, once your dog can fully relax on that mat at home, then we can take it out into public, but not until it's great at home. How to do that, that's something that we really dive into in like our advanced beginnings course. That's stuff we talk about in our academy. But we are going to get into some of that here as well because focus is a huge, huge challenge for most of our adolescent dogs. Um, 